Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Chris Noon Lecture. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to draw your attention to two upcoming events. On Tuesday, March 19 at 4 p.m., the Wise Center for Emerging Democracies and Greece will co-sponsor a lecture by Thomas De Waal, Senior Associate with the Russian and Eurasian Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he will lecture on Getting Georgia Right, uh, the former Soviet Union's most unexpected country. Please also join us for the next Greece Noon Lecture on March 20th. Our speaker will be Patrick Patterson, Associate Professor of History at the University of California, San Diego. His talk is entitled Bought and Sold, Living and Losing the Good Life in Socialist Yugoslavia. And now I'm delighted to introduce our today's speaker, Vladimir Tisminiano. Uh, professor Tisminiano is a professor of politics at the University of Maryland, College Park. In 2006, he served as a chairman of the Presidential Commission for the Analysis of the Communist Dictatorship in Romania. From 1998 to 2004, he was editor of East European Politics and Societies and continues to serve on the journal's editorial committee. His books include Reinventing Politics, Eastern Europe from Stalin to Havel, Free Press, 1992, Fantasies of Salvation, Princeton U University Press, 1998, Stalin Stalinism for All Seasons, a, po a Political History of Romanian Communism, published in 2003 by University of California Press, and The Devil in History, uh, Communism, Fascism, and Some Lessons of the 20th Century, University of California Press, 2012. It's Professor Tisminiano's most recent book. He is also the editor of numerous volumes, including Stalin, Stalin, Stalinism Revisited, uh, the, pro uh, the Promises of 1968, uh, The End of the Beginning, uh, um, co-published with uh, Bogdan Jakob, all published by Central European University Press. Um, his current project, a book under contract with Cambridge uh, University Press, deals with democracy and memory in post-communist Romania and is based on uh, the author's experience as head of the Presidential Commission. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tisminiano. Thank you. Professor Mayorova for this uh, kind introduction. Thanks the center and thank you for coming. Uh, thanks Nicole for organizing the event and thank you for coming here and, uh, and uh, be ready to share with me some of the uh, topics in the book. Uh, it's good that you mentioned, thank you, the series of volumes edited uh, by me and then in collaboration with my former grad student Bogdan Christian Jakob uh, at Central European University Press. Three volumes have come out and uh, two or three more are coming out and basically the ambition of this uh, huge project has been to cover the second half of the 20th century and uh, the beginning of the 21st century uh, in a um, um, cross-country uh, uh, internationalized version of political science history and other disciplines, diplomatic history and so on, uh, of the humanities. The first volume indeed is Stalinism Revisited, the second volume is The Promises of Nine 1968 Crisis, Illusion, Utopia. Uh, the third volume uh, is uh, The End at the Beginning, The Revolutions of 1989 and the Resurgence of History. Uh, the fourth volume coming out this year and we'll launch it at the AAAS, whatever the new name is. A, I cannot say that, I'm old fashioned. Okay, so AAAS in Boston and it's going to be on uh, coming to terms with the past in post-traumatic societies. Uh, the fifth volume will come out next 
next year. It's about um, uh, the seduction, the totalitarian temptation and the seduction of intellectuals by uh, grandiose, um, let's say, radical theories. Uh, and uh, six will be based on a symposium that takes place at Boston College next week. And the title is Dreams of Total Power, Dictators and Dictatorships in Our Times. So six volumes basically covering uh, the most important experiences of the second half of the 20th century. It's not uh, Eurocentric. We cover Latin America, the Middle East, and so on and so forth. So definitely linked to uh, the topic today because obviously... Uh, one of the things that uh, can be said about a number of recent books is the, uh, let's start with this, is the return uh, of a revised version of the totalitarian paradigm. Uh, some of you are uh, clearly aware that uh, the concept of totalitarianism uh, has been extremely controversial and uh, there has been lots of uh, criticism of the concept of totalitarianism and a lot of praise. Uh, history, to some extent in political science and in other fields of the humanities. Uh, we have a number of books that have come out, and uh, I'll leave mine uh, at the end, uh, that are addressing this issue based on new archival material and uh, bring back uh, the discussion of uh, how totalitarian those societies were in uh, exposed or uh, yes exposed to the uh, type of social engineering associated with stalinism and if we can even use the concept of totalitarianism what are the meanings etc and the first book that comes to mind which i strongly recommend i reviewed it in tls uh, it's an applebaum's uh, book um, it's um, um, the iron curtain the crushing of eastern europe 1944 1956 that came out uh, several months Ago. The second book that I uh, again reviewed in Times Higher Education last week is uh, Robert Gelatelli's book, uh, which is widely discussed, and it's called Stalin's Curse. It was published by Random House la on March 5th, precisely on the uh, 60th anniversary of uh, uh, the greatest genius of humanity's uh, blessed uh, passing away. Uh, okay, so, uh, and it's called Stalin's Curse, Battling for Communism in uh, World World War II and in the Cold War. Robert Gelatelli is known for his previous work on the Holocaust, especially Nazi Germany, obviously, and uh, also his book published a few years ago, which is called um, uh, The Age of Social Catastrophe, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, The Age of Social Catastrophe, which is one of the uh, books that in a way inspired my own, uh, my own demarche, my own uh, project. Okay, so... Um, I would give you a few quotations. You didn't distribute my uh, list of quotations, so I can go into my quotations easily. I, uh, I should give credit to one of the readers of the books. I found it on Amazon, uh, okay? And one reader find a number of quotations in the book that I had completely forgotten about because once you finish a project, then you move into the next project and uh, then you discover this was a sense of what probably psychology and uh, early, uh, you know, the uh, Hege Hege uh, let's say Hegelian Marxism what called the effect of alienation okay so it is how you find your own products uh, looking to you as something alien okay so this is when people ask me what is alienation or reification this is exactly what alienation is okay so let me uh, give you some quotations uh, from the book and then I think a uh, very uh, two very uh, or three very appropriate uh, remarks linked to the book and then a presentation on the general approach that I promote. So, uh, as I said, it's the main discussion that we can have is to what extent a revised concept of totalitarianism, I emphasize revised, this is not a return to the 1950s, this is not a return to the Cold War mentality or anything like that. This is the result of a lot of research in the archives that even some quote unquote, uh, revisionist historians would admit that are important to be taken into account. After all, I think with all due respect that the publication of Everyday Stalinism by Professor Sheila Fitzpatrick is a response to the archival challenge. The archives have shown how uh, ubiquitous the Communist Party's domination was in the, in the communist countries, was not just a, an illusion of the uh, uh, totalitarian school that the party was in absolute control 
over the society in uh, we speak about and I want to emphasize we don't speak here about the de-radicalized de communist regimes I don't speak here about you know Tito Titoism in the 1960s or Qadarism in the 1970s that would of course kill my approach. We speak the comparison between the totalitarian regime in Nazi Germany and the Soviet regime or the Mao regime is basically during the most radical times of those regimes. This is the starting point for any kind of good faith discussion. Otherwise, of course, uh, with the, pro the difference is a major difference. We don't know basically, and I'll uh, engage a little bit in counterfactual history because it's necessary for my own demonstration, uh, we don't know how a de-radicalized Nazi regime would have looked like. We have seen just the radicalization. You read, for instance, uh, Richard Evans's uh, wonderful review in uh, London Review of Books last week. It's online, you can find it. Uh, Richard Evans reviews these two books about, one is uh, Letters to Mussolini. Okay, we have seen, and he goes into the Mussolini experience. We've seen, we've seen the transformation of Mussolini from a less radical dictator into a radical dictator, basically, a totalitarian dictator. Okay, so we have seen the totalitarianization of the Nazi regime, but, or uh, the fascist regime in Italy. We have not seen the uh, other uh, side. We have not seen a denazified uh, like we've seen a de-Stalinized Soviet regime. We have not seen de-Hitlerization in Nazi Germany. Uh, this is the counterfactual. Okay, so uh, I always to anticipate the counterfactual. It's in my book, actually. Can one imagine, and since the book is dedicated to the memory of Tony Judd, among other people, can one imagine, for instance, a 20th NSDAP Congress that would take place following a victory of Nazi Germany in World War II, in which Patagenosse, let's say, Bormann, would deliver a secret speech uh, deploring the excesses and the atrocities associated with the cult of personality of Adolf Hitler. Try to make it. I mean, I know people who engage in this after I provoked that at the Remark Institute when I gave my talk, <laughs> and they said, I can imagine. Uh, I personally cannot, okay. And for many reasons, the most important reasons, and that's uh, the late Albert Hirschman, one of the greatest scholars uh, in the field of humanities, uh, wrote a wonderful article about self-subversion. So to engage in self-subversion of my own argument, I would say that the main distinction, I will not start with the similarities, but I would start with the main distinction. There was no previous point to go back to in the Nazi experience as you had in the Soviet experience. There was in the Soviet experience the possibility of a return to Lenin and if the return to Lenin turned out to be a false return because Lenin himself could be demonstrated as gelatinely does in his book uh, The so Age of Social Catastrophe or Pipes or whoever else at this moment it's a, com you know, it's a consensus that the totalitarian experiment started under Lenin okay, then you go to Marx and if Marx is not sufficient, then you go to Bakunin, or you go to whoever wants. You can find some place. If you turn the clock back and you want to go back, what do you go to? You go to Wagner's anti-Semitism, you go to racism, you, go, you don't have any humanist <laughs> tradition to refer to and to rehabilitate. What okay? We'll, we'll talk about Bukharin. Okay. Uh, Bukharin signed, I mean, it's very simple. Bukharin is easily... Uh, it's, a, it's an easy target in the story. Uh, Bukharin signed, like all the members of the Politburo in March 1921, the decision to repress Kronstadt. So basically, for me, this is finished. Okay, so did Trotsky. Okay, once you sign, the first anti-Bolshevik uprising is repressed in a most vicious and bloody way. And you sign this, that means, okay, that means Bukharin is already involved in the story and very strongly so. So that's not, but that's true. You, are, you, you, you came with a very, very good question. Thank you very much, because I think that that was the first illusion of Gorbachevism, <laughs> to go back to Bukharin. I mean, remember the clubs for return to Bukharin and so on, and including some people whom I respect deeply uh, in the field of Soviet studies and Russian studies, including a well-known biographer of Bukharin. Uh, okay, I, uh, no, I'm not going to give names. Probably most of the people know whom I have in mind. Uh, okay, so they are still convinced that uh, that would have been the alternative. Okay, the book is dedicated, by the way, uh, to the memory of Tony Judd, but also the memory of Robert C. Tucker. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, locked, I, 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 I talked a lot to Tucker about that. So I, uh, 
Tucker's position, I think it's a very important position that a, as a matter of fact that Lenin's death, there was a multiplicity of Lenin's. Okay, so I, I agree with that. So one of the things that I want to emphasize in this book, I tried very hard uh, to op uh, oppose uh, monocausality and determinism. To quote uh, one of the greatest minds of Eastern Europe and one of the most important dissidents of Eastern Europe, uh, Adam Michnik, I think he was right when he said, if I learned something in the 20th century, is that determinism doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, who would have thought in 1983 that solidarity would win the elections in 1989 and all the rest that would happen? It, you know, uh, no, uh, let's say post-communism was a utopia truly utopia, in the real sense, in the etymological sense of utopia, a non-possibility, and even more than that, it was a non-thinkable. So uh, basically, with the exception of uh, the late and much regretted Andrea Malrik, uh, nobody thought about the post-communist Soviet Union. Or you had it in the forms of literary utopias like Vladimir Voinovich and th things like that. But you didn't have people, because it was, you know, how could one imagine the un unimaginable? Okay, so uh, a few quotations from the book, then a short presentation on the book and, uh, and the ideas, and then uh, questions and, if possible, for me, answers. Okay, uh, the main lessons of the 20th century that I try, I've tried to highlight are that no ideological commitment, no matter how frantically absorbing, should ever prevail over the sanctity of human life and that no party, movement, or leader holds the right to dictate the follow that followers renounce their critical faculties to embrace a pseudo-miraculous, in fact, mystically self-centered, delusional vision of mandatory happiness. That's a key element. People ask me, what lesson? Okay, this is a lesson. Perhaps too, 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 too jargon-laden here, but I, I try to make it clear. The main difficulty with the Marxian project is its lack of sensit sensitivity to the psychological makeup of mankind. These obsessional social classes, or what French sociologist Lucien Goldman once referred to as the viewpoint of trans-individual historical subject, a Lukacian formulation to be sure, the failure to take into account the infinite diversity of human nature, the eagerness to reduce history to a conflict between polar social categories, bourgeoisie and proletariat, etc., etc. This is indeed the substratum of an ideology that, wedded to a sectarian fanatic political movements, has generated many illusions and much grief throughout the 20th century. Um, second thesis. Where is Lenin coming? So far it was Marx. Lenin was not only the founder of political propaganda. This is fact. Okay, the supreme priest of a new ecclesiology of the omniscient, infallible party, but also the demiurge of a concentration camp system base, system and the apostle of universal terror. I'm now reviewing a book by a guy called, whatever, Neil Ryan, I think is his name, and it's uh, Lenin's Terror. It's a uh, perfect analysis of this, uh, uh, of how it happened and uh, its consequences. If you want more in the book, there's a lot of discussion about Lenin and Leninism. This is relatively benign and known. Uh, what is less benign and less known, and it's uh, provoked a, uh, you know, an interesting discussion, is how, you know, obviously Leninism, you know, is a famous line when we say, Len what is Lenin? Very important. I said the new ecclesiology is the concept of the party. The key element in Leninism, so you can live, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous line in uh, one of the most important books of, uh, Ma of the Marxist tradition, uh, 1923 published, uh, Georg Lukács, History and Class Consciousness. In History and Class Consciousness, Georg Lukács, um, uh, there's one essay, the subtitle of the book is Essays in Marxist Dialectics. Uh, and uh, it became one of the accursed books of the, uh, of the Marxist tradition. It's a very important book. In, in which he said uh, the following, it's an essay which is called uh, What is Orthodox Marxism? Orthodox meant in a positive way, not as a pejorative term, okay? Uh, not dogmatic Marxism. Orthodox means faithful Marxism or uh, authentic Marxism or genuine Marxism, okay? So he said a uh, um, good Marxist, an Orthodox Marxist, is someone who can leave aside all the practical conclusions of Karl Marx's philosophy. Every single sentence that Karl Marx wrote can be thrown, jettisoned, thrown away, as long as the person remains faithful to the method. Some people call it the pan-methodologism, okay, of Lukács. I would not discuss now the meaning of the Lukács's uh, 
axiom, I would simply postulate, the pan-methodological postulate, so to speak, okay, I would simply say that uh, in Lenin's case, one can leave aside every single sentence that Lenin produced in his life as long and one still remains faithful to Lenin and Leninism, as long and one recognizes the sanctity, the centrality, the sacredness of the Communist Party in the Leninist revolutionary cosmology. Okay, this is the key element. This is not, I'm not original, I quote in this uh, very important book, which is translated into English, you can find it in, published by Columbia University Press, by one of the greatest political thinkers of the 20th century, French political philosopher Claude Lefort which is called La Complication in French, Essay sur la question communiste, the complication, an essay on the communist question. It came out in, French, in English translation from Columbia University Press. Mm -hmm. Some of you are familiar with Lefort's work on Machiavelli and uh, on bureaucratic institutions and so on. And he emphasized, okay, uh, to bring, since we, this is a center for Russian East European studies, I will, uh, am I right? Okay, so uh, the, I would emphasize also the importance in Lenin's centralism, the party is the most central point. And there is a superb analysis of the meaning of centrality in the communist cosmology by Jan Plamper in his wonderful book about the cult of personality of Stalin's cult of the cult of personality in Russian, in Soviet culture, where he said the central means in the Soviet cosmology means sacred. Uh, how Stalin appears, in the, his analysis, iconological analysis of different paintings in the Stalin's cult. Uh, the, the book was published last year by Yale University Press, and it's called, it has a wonderful title that doesn't come to mind exactly, The Alchemy of Power. Okay. Stalin's cult, The Alchemy of Power. It's a superb book, Jan Plumper. It, it, it's also superbly published. I mean, it has fantastic reproductions. It's, it's a beautiful book, in addition to being a great book, okay? So if you look for gifts for, I don't know, uh, birthday, Christmas, and so on, I promote it, okay? So tell Jan. I reviewed it in International Affairs and gave a glowing, a glowing review, okay? So with Lenin and Leninism, it's relatively, so Jan Plumper, uh, The Alchemy of Power, The Cult of Stalin. Okay, so um, with Lenin, Leninism is relatively simple. The problem is when you go into the comparison. And here we enter a uh, minefield. Uh, because, of course, this can be very easily, the discussion about, or the analogy between communism and, uh, and fascism, can be very easily politicized. And it is, it has been very politicized, and it has been used for political purposes, and I'll try to discuss a little bit uh, later. So what I say here, fascism and communism as political movements were resolutions to a painfully and universally, universally felt sense-making crisis throughout Europe. Born out of the cataclysmic barbarism, I want to emphasize that the concept of barbarism and barba or yeah, barbarism, uh, in explaining the rise of, of communism and fascism, although we know some people here are students of, his, of uh, political ideas and history, know, of course, the roots of fascism are in the 19th century. So the approach that fascism says that fascism was a response to communism, the Noltean approach, is ignoring to some extent uh, the fact that there were, for instance, the Zev Sternel's work on the French roots of fascism, for instance, which are 19th century, okay? Or the Russian roots of fascism, which existed in the 19th century. Needless to speak about the German roots of fascism and so on. So that's before Lenin's gulag that appears very much in the Nolte explanation and his famous theory of the causal nexus, okay? Uh, in Ernst Nolte, the European Civil War. Okay, it's even before. So it's, yeah, so I have a problem with the causal nexus because, not because of uh, some of the discussions, but because I think it's ignoring a previous tradition that fascism was very much coming from. So, and, and come. so uh, born out of the cataclysmic barbarism, the concept of barbarism is extremely important. Uh, I participated in, in 2005 at uh, a conference organized by Susan Neyman, who worked extensively on radical evil. Uh, she's running the Einstein Forum in, in, in Potsdam, and by Tony Judd. And the conference took place in Potsdam. It was the 100th anniversary of the theory of relativity, I think, or something like that. So it was linked to Einstein. Okay, so, uh, and uh, the, the, you know, I discussed, speaking of theory of relativity, my paper there was about moral or relativism, communist, fascism, and moral relativism. Relativism. It was a very interesting experience because among the people who were there was Eric Hobsbawm, uh, 
uh, which was a quite interesting conversation that followed. Tim Snyder, uh, we st I still have on my you know wall there a picture with Tim Snyder, myself, and Eric Hobsbawm. Okay, Eric Hobsbawm, Tim Snyder, myself, to be more more uh, you know to engage in Comrade Stalin's immodest modesty. That's the <laughs> that's the concept that Plumper comes with. Uh, that's my favorite line when pa Stalin adds to his short biography with by by hand and said, "And Comrade Stalin is known for his boundless modesty." Uh, written by him, and Plumper has a superb term for that: Stalin's immodest modesty. Okay, so okay, so uh, okay, and I took from Hobsbawm, with whom I disagree on many, many issues, especially when he, the way he saw Marxism and so on. But he was right. In order to understand the coming of the advent of the Bolshevik Revolution, one needs to understand the barbarization of the world in World War One. Things that were unthinkable or definitely unacceptable until 1914, Hobsbawm argued in his book of Age of Extremes, but I, this, during this long conversation I had with him in Potsdam, remained very important, and I used it in my own approach. So this, I don't have an ideological approach, so I can quote without any problem, Eric Hobsbawm. Okay, so, the apocalyptic movement proclaimed the advent of the millennium in this world, or to use political philosopher Eric Fögelin's formulation, they tried, sorry for the jargon, to immanent, immanentize the eschaton or basically to, uh, this is the essence of any fundamentalism, and I see political uh, teleologies like the ones that I discuss in this, in this book, I see them as attempts to, um, sorry, it's political philosophy, uh, the, uh, to abolish the distinction between the city of God and the city of man. Or that's to immanent, immanentize the eschaton, eschaton being the sacred, and the uh, world beyond, the world beyond, and to make it this worldly. Okay, this is the story, okay, that I'm trying. And that's Fergalin in his uh, book on political religions, when he speaks about, when he analyzed fascism as a political religion, and he used exactly this term, the immanentization of eschaton, of the eschaton, of the sacred. Okay, so, um, this is uh, for a book about the incarnation. Now, uh, you ask me, what is the de devil in the story? The devil is in, in all the story, and it's a uh, concept that I borrowed, basically. The title is borrowed from Leszek Kwiatkowski. It's a very famous interview that Kwiatkowski gave in the 1970s to George Urban. It's included in the volume Stalinism and its impact on the world, by edited by George Urban. And it's also in Kwiatkowski's collection of essays, including in the My Correct Views on Everything. Uh, it's the title being exactly The Devil in History. Uh, you'd ask me if I had permission. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was in touch with Professor Kowalkowski before his death. As a matter of fact, I was one of the uh, interesting three persons who wrote the obituaries for Kowalkowski in Gazeta Viborcha when he passed, passed away. And uh, it was very interesting because the other obituary was by somebody whom I deeply disagree with. And he's mentioned quite frequently in the book, although I appreciate his early writings very much. Obviously, I have in mind, uh, or less obviously, the Slovene philosopher Slavoj Žižek. Okay, so uh, I always have a problem in the, you know, why Žižek wrote a beautiful obituary of Kowalkowski, never mentions Kowalkowski in his writings. Uh, knowing very well what Kowalkowski wrote, because it's very hard to engage in the type of return to Leninist that Žižek is uh, presenting these days, uh, if you take Kowalkowski seriously. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there are two Zizeks. Zizek writes the obituary for Krakowski in Gazeta Wyborcza in Polish, okay, and Zizek of the, uh, whatever it's called, uh, the latest book, uh, Less Than Nothing. Okay, so, um, the, de the devil. Of course, uh, when, asked <laughs> when asked if he meant uh, the <coughs> devil uh, in a metaphorical way or he meant the devil as a uh, reality, Kowalkowski responded, who has a great, those who have read Kowalkowski know that the man had an extraordinary sense of humor. And uh, his answer was, uh, without any joke whatsoever, he said, I mean it as literally as you can take it. Okay, because anybody who has read, and as a matter of fact, this is very important, anybody who has read probably the most important book about the Great Terror, which is obviously, uh, historical speaking, that I can give you three books about the Great Terror, the most recent one, the superb book by Karl Schlegel, Moscow, 1937, then you have the Great Terror by Robert Conquest, and probably, I don't know, other books that I can uh, come with, but the greatest book about the Great Terror in Moscow, in uh, Katarina Clark's about Moscow, capital, whatever, the fourth, uh, 
the false false Rome and so on. But the greatest book about that, and I think that uh, that's the way Schlegel starts his book, is of course Master and Margarita. <laughs> okay, so the, you know the best book ever written about <laughs> Moscow in 1936-37, and it starts with who is visiting Moscow in 1937. That's the starting point. How many people read here? Well, I'm sure all well, read. Ma okay, Master Margarita starts with the visit of the devil in Moscow in 1936-37, and uh, my friend Christina Vatulescan has a recent book, which is a wonderful book that I recommend uh, here: Police Aesthetics starts with this, you know, this. What, what is amazing is that uh, Bulgakov's wife was keeping a diary that makes, for me, this is uh, this, the this challenging thing. How could people keep diaries in Moscow in 1937? And several other people kept diaries. It's an interesting story. Okay. So, this is a book about the incarnation of diabolical nihilistic principles of human subjugation and conditioning in the name of presumably pure and purifying goals. I didn't ask you for nothing about uh, Vladimir Solovyov because my whole concept of interpreting this is uh, Vladimir Solovyov was a Russian uh, Christian existentialist, if you want, uh, writer, philosopher, and some people argue, I'm not sure where I read it, but I may be wrong, that actually Dostoevsky met him and it was a source of inspiration for Alyosha Karamazov, okay, so in uh, Karamazov Brothers. So, okay, uh, there is a book that brought, you know, I read his Antichrist and I read a lot of Solovyov, but then I read French uh, political philosopher and historian Alain Besançon, and he has a wonderful little book which is translated into English which is called La Falsification du Bien so the falsification of the good so the answer that I found is a comparison between Solovyov and Orwell it's a great little book, 140 pages, and I love it. Okay, so uh, Alain Besançon, La Falsification du, du Bien and in that book I think I found, because all the time I said like most of my fellow thinkers on this topic of communism and fascism, I said communism uh, basically or fascism abolished traditional distinctions between good and evil. That's the classic line. And then the more I thought about that, and this book is basically a testimony to my own process of understanding what I was writing about, and I think that I read most, most of what one could read about that, uh, is that the issue is not simply abolishing the distinctions, but basically uh, substituting the concept of good, and by consequence, the substance. That's what the work of devil in history is: to introduce a falsified concept of good. And I give a number of examples. You have examples, you know, when, for instance, one of my examples is Himmler's speech in 1943 in Poznan or Posen, when he speaks about things that we cannot utter, things that we cannot say. We know that they are good, but humanity is not prepared. Uh, receive our message. We'll act knowing that this is good, that means the final solution. We'll purify humanity, we'll get rid of the vermin, and one day we'll come, maybe we'll not experience that moment, but our heirs will experience it, and they will be thanked by humanity for what we've done. This is not simply abolishing the distinction between good and evil. It has a vision of good. Uh, this is, uh, the other day I saw uh, uh, one of the most disturbing films. Uh, it's called Enemy, Enemies of the People. Uh, it's a film about the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, got the best documentary from Sundance F Festival and so on. Uh, I saw it, uh, you can find it. It's online and uh, it's, uh, Enemies of the People. And uh, I talked a lot to Shabbat with the Sabbat, okay, so it's the mm, director and the main character in the film. It's a long discussion between him who lost his mother, father, and brother in the killing fields, and the number two of the Khmer Rouge regime. So that happened last week, so it's not in my book, but uh, whenever I give this presentation, I'm not on the lecture circuit, so I give my presentations every week, so I add things, because I saw this film, and he came to one of my presentations, and he really, I'm going to bring him to my class, I teach a uh, class on revolutions, authoritarianism, and film, and I want my students to, to see it. It's the discussion with this guy, um, his name was uh, Ruan, uh, no, Nguyen uh, Cha, the number two, he was a deputy general to Pol Pot, uh, who accepted to speak. I'm not going to 
I'm a great uh, film spoiler. My students tell me. I tell them from the beginning what's going on. And they said, this is the most interesting class, but you should not tell us the beginning what the film, how the film concludes and so on. <laughs> Do it after the class. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you more, but enter, you know, Google and just put enemies of the people and uh, his name is Sabat S.A. I think, whatever, not like a Sabbat, I'm not, I don't have the, oh, you'll find it, it's very, so Khmer Rouge, and you'll find the, uh, including fragments of the conversation with the, with the executioner. A man who is now uh, indicted, he's in prison, uh, and so on, uh, who is basically responsible for the assassination of uh, 1.8 million people. Okay. Uh, so the book that you're going, to, we can discuss here, is not a historical treatise, although history is present on every page, but rather political, philosophical, it's a book of history of ideas. And one of the things that I emphasize a lot is that without understanding the role of ideology, we don't understand these two experiences. This is, I think, the key element that Professor Richard Overy, who reviewed this book in Times Higher Education, emphasized, that ideology is, and he's the author of one of the most admired and respected books on Hitler and Stalin. Okay, so I was extremely, and you know, I it's one of the best things that can happen to an author is to have your book reviewed by somebody you admire enormously whom you've never met in your life. You know, I've never had anything but admiration for Professor Overy, so to suddenly get this, okay? So that's, for me, a great thing. Okay, so um, it is a political philosophical interpretation of how maximalist utopian aspirations can lead to the nightmares of Soviet and Nazi camps epitomized by Kolyma and Auschwitz. Uh, basically, the main questions, I will not be able to go into too many details, but the main questions here for me, and we can discuss it if we have time, is how was it possible that two systems based on two very, very different ideologies, uh, extremely different in terms of their own origins and presumably of their intentions or intentionalities, if you want, presented striking similarities in terms of structure and results, the role of the party and other elements that I emphasize as being vi structurally similar, but most important in terms of their results, mass murder. That's the question, that's the big puzzle for me. How was it possible? And why do I approach this topic? I approach this topic because I became increasingly aware by a paradox that Tony Judd once formulated very well. And I think you find it in his conversation with Timothy Snyder, the book that came out last year. And uh, which is why in the West, comparing communism and fascism usually creates a sense of uneasiness, to put it this way. While in the East, this uneasiness creates an uneasiness. Okay, well, how, what is happening? And why can't we somehow go in the direction of, let's call it, unifying European memory and show the same type of compassion or allow for the presence in the moral imagination of humanity of both mass horrors or mass crimes to be present without one overshadowing, presumably, the other one? This is the key elements. What is the problem here? Uh, and then we have uh, the problem. So again, counterfactually, or less counterfactually, because now I just mentioned yesterday, I finished reading a book, I am reviewing it by Andy Nagorski, uh, one of the most brilliant American journalists. The book is called uh, Hitlerland. And it's about American journalists and diplomats in uh, Nazi Germany between in the 1930s. It's a very interesting book. I'm not going to say more because I don't want to spoil. I recommend the book. Uh, okay, ha it is quite interesting that you had much less readiness to engage in mismaking making about the Nazi regime from that moment on among the Americans there. There's a lot of open-mindedness and lucidity and clear-mindedness. Yes, there are some naives and some idiots and some, but in general, the approach is very lucid. They know what's going on. Well, you have a very different approach to the Soviet Union at the same moment. At the same time, while we know for sure, I don't know if Tim Snyder lectured here, but most of the people read his book, Bloodlands, we know for sure that in, let's say, 1936, 
There is no comparison whatsoever in terms of number of victims between the Soviet regime and the Nazi regime. No comparison. We cannot compare. Simply, the Soviet regimes had already, during the Holodomor and whatever happened, millions of victims in the early 1930s. This is not to excuse the Nazi regime, but after 1939, when it becomes basically a genocidal regime. It is not actively engaged in genocide before 1939. It's engaged in lots of reprehensible activities, but it is not genocidal. We can go into if it was intentionally or non-intentionally genocidal, what it was there, but it's not the purpose of, uh, of my talk here. So that I see a paradox. How is it possible for a political project called communism meant to lead to universal emancipation to have as its outcome, as the last lines of Kalkowski's trilogy on Marxism says, the uh, climax of human bondage and abysmal atrocities. That's something that one needs to understand. How, therefore, for instance, uh, part of the answer is propaganda. It played a very important role. But propaganda, Nazi propaganda, was also very powerful and never achieved the same type of extraordinary accomplishments in the uh, public awareness in the West as uh, the Soviet propaganda. Uh, mental counterfactual exercise. In 1937, uh, one of the most famous at that moment German emigre writers, novelists, and very influential figure, Leon Feuchtwanger, goes to Moscow. He's invited to uh, attend in the audience uh, the second Moscow show trial, the trial of Pyatakov, uh, Radek, uh, Rakovsky, and so on. Uh, we are in March 19, if I'm not wrong, March 1937. Uh, he had witnesses, then he goes and has a conversation with Stalin. Uh, the, the result of the conversation with Stalin, the result of his trip to Moscow, the result of his trip to the Soviet Union is a book called N Moscow 1937, which came out in Russian translation and became an important part of the Soviet propaganda in which he basically endorsed the Soviet official line on the show trials and so on. Uh, I repeat, German, Jewish writer, member of, not a communist, not member of the Communist Party, member of the anti-fascist exile, German exile. Imagine, now this is the counterfactual, that uh, in 1939, after, no, that in November 1938, a writer goes to Berlin a week after or during the Kristallnacht, has a conversation with Hitler after that, publishes a book with the title Berlin 1938, in which basically he shows how the Jews were uh, destroying the German economy and deserved what happened to them, that probably there were some excesses, but definitely the Führer had no idea about them, and when he heard about them, he stopped everything. Uh, and so on. So he would have been forever the uh, mm, beneficiary of universal disgrace. Forever. Not the case. So here again, a paradox. Why? So this is very much the book that I bring to your attention. It's very much an attempt to uh, overcome what I find to be extremely disturbing, the double standards in dealing with these uh, two systems. Uh, some people may not be happy. Uh, you know, it's not my, I, I've, I've, I've lived 30 years of my life under mandatory happiness, so I don't want everybody to be happy. It's not my purpose. Uh, I know some people who say that the comparison uh, is illegitimate. Uh, let me say very clearly that I agree with Timothy Snyder. Those who say that the compar comparison is illegitimate have already made a comparison and decided in one particular direction. Okay, so that's not uh, a necessarily a disingenuous position uh, or an honest position, better said. Okay, uh, so uh, the power of the communist propaganda is something that, of course, deserves to be discussed here. The communist international uh, propaganda machine, which was never reached by anything similar from the other side. For one simple reason, because communism was international and internationalist, national socialists could be 
international, but never internationalist. That's the starting point. Arendt does a very good job in discussing that in the origins, when she says that a mo any movement which is based on race is, ma is based on a limitation. It's basically impossible to become a planetary movement to attract the kind of global appeals or to exert the, the, ta the type of global appeals that communism could exert and for such a long period of time. It was simply uh, doomed to be limited. Uh, a great historian, Francois Furet, some of you read, of course, The Passing of an Illusion or his writings on Marx and the French Revolution and his book on, of course, uh, Rethinking the French Revolution. Uh, Francois Furet said that both, and uh, as a matter of fact, this is a starting point in my own analysis, is that two, the two projects were or are to be seen as um, failed. I don't like the translation failed, uh, derailed. That's the real translation because in French it's dévoyé. Voir and dévoyé. Okay, derailed. So th he said communism is a derailed project, a de derailed offspring of the Enlightenment, and fascism is a derailed offspring of the counter Enlightenment. If you take, or also from Fure, communism is a pathology of universalism, fascism is a pathology of particularism. Uh, because, leave pathology aside, okay? Uh, Particularism cannot be, it's by definition particular, it cannot be universal. It's, it's very definition that emphasizes a certain group as being the beneficiary of all the great achievements of humanity and so on and so forth. Uh, the nobility and so on. In this case, the Aryan nation, the uh, Germanic nation and so on. Communism is ecumenical. It's uh, in the etymological sense, Catholic, okay, universal. Uh, so, since we are coming, uh, getting closer to one o'clock, I'll finish with, uh, there are many things that I could have uh, said. I took only point one of this list of discussions, but I'll uh, finish with um, uh, some lines from the book or about the book or about the topics of the book. The Communist International's propaganda machine defended human rights against the abominable atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, obscuring the fact that I mentioned before that until 1939, most mass crimes in Europe were in fact committed by the Stalinists in the USSR. So therefore, I try to discuss, to explore, to examine uh, political passions, radicalism, utopian ideals and their catastrophic consequences in the 20th century experiments in massive social engineering. Both regimes were involved in enormous. In the case of the Soviet Union, things are not a surprise. They define themselves, quote, the great experiment. They that was the experimental notion was at the heart of the Soviet. If you want to understand Sovietism, and this is exactly what Steve Kotkin does in his book uh, about Soviet civilization, what is, you know, a magnetic mountain, uh, basically it was an experiment in creating a uh, new civilization. Uh, some of you are familiar with the one of my favorite, uh, let's say, uh, situations, intellectual situations, the webs. The webs were Sidney and Beatrice Webb, very well-known intellectuals, Britain, Fabian society, etc., etc. Uh, progressives, with all the good things about the progressives. Uh, the webs went to the Soviet Union in the 1920s, published their first book, which was called The USSR, A New Civilization? Question uh, mark. In the 1930s, they revisited the Soviet Union and they um, uh, they uh, published a book, The USSR, A New Civilization, and they deleted the question mark. Uh, were the webs aware of what was going on or not? That's a key element in the... Uh, please, those who have not read, I recommend very pr uh, strongly a book by Michael David Fox, the recent book by Michael David Fox, who teaches, was my colleague at Mellon, now he's at Georgetown. The book is called Showcasing the Great Experiment. It's about Soviet cultural diplomacy in the 1930s. It's a fabulous book based on archives, the archives of the whatever uh, Soviet Association for uh, links with the, uh, what was the, Vox, Vox right, Vox, the V-O-K-S, okay, uh, which was, I had no idea that the first president of Vox was uh, Kamenev's sister. No, so Kamenev's wife and Trotsky's sister, Olga Kamenev, and so on, very interesting stuff. Okay, so, uh, 
Beatrice Webb was more aware of what was going on, and as a matter of fact, but they were completely controlled, mentally controlled by the Soviet ambassador Ivan Maisky, to, to a great extent, their information, and they were shocked by the pact in 1939, but they decided, classic case for fellow travelers, they decided not to speak up because that would bring grist to the mill of the reactionaries and so on. So they kept their disappointment very private. Okay, so they allowed for the illusions to go on. So uh, it is important, therefore, to, to try to map and explain what Hannah Arendt called the ideological storms of a century second to none in violence, hubris, ruthlessness, and human sacrifices. Now, uh, three final quotes, and then we can have any questions uh, you have. Uh, Kolakowski. The devil invented ideological states, that is to say, states whose legitimacy is grounded in the fact that their owners are owners of truth. If you oppose such a state or its system, you are not simply an anti-state person. Like in a other type of dictatorship, you are, or you become, quote from Kolakowski, an enemy of truth. That explains the, um, how do I call it, uh, almost um, the sectarian, but it mo there should be another term there. If you're on the quasi-Talmudist type of struggles that take place around a particular sentence in Lenin in the 1920s, or a particular, how Lenin discusses when he wants to smash the renegade Kautsky in his famous pamphlet, The Proletarian Revolution, the renegade Kautsky, the interpretation of the meaning of the war dictatorship of the proletariat. There are pages and pages there that he goes on and on what it means, the dictatorship of the proletariat, okay? So that for any lay person's ear sounds absolutely lunacy. I mean, why would people engage in this type of debate? Because these were ideocratic systems. If you don't see the role of ideology as defining the truth, then we miss the point, about, uh, basically. What kind of systems uh, we talk about? Uh, second, uh, it's a very interesting uh, quotation. I found it from one of my favorite writers. He's a um, British, Australian, whatever, uh, cultural critic, Clive James, those who read, uh, you know, uh, TLS and so on. I mean, he's a very, very smart guy. So he says, a measure of our slowness to face up to the real history of the Soviet Union is that the expression Kirov Ballet does not strike us as obscene. The expression Himmler Youth Orchestra would. Imagine a trip to <laughs> Washington DC at the Kennedy Center of the Himmler Youth Orchestra. Nobody has a problem with the Kirov Ballet. While we know for sure that Kirov was one of the top Bolsheviks involved in <laughs> most of the Bolshevik atrocities and so on, and far from being the great guy described by a certain type of historiography. Okay, and the last one is from uh, uh, a review in TLS of my book by one of my favorite political thinkers, John Gray, uh, who wrote the following, blindness to the true nature of communism is an inability to accept that radical evil can come from the pursuit of progress. Uh, this is the problem. And uh, I'll end up with one of my favorite lines, which I sent after that to John Gray after he published this uh, great review in TLS. And I said, you know, that really uh, struck a very responsive chord with me because I always had a problem with the concept of progress, especially the mechanical deterministic vision of progress. And in one of my favorite books that I quote in, in uh, The Devil in History, and probably one of the two or three most devastatingly important analysis of uh, what communism meant in the Soviet Union. I have in mind the two volumes of memoirs by Nadezhda Mandelstam. Uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam quotes Osip Mandelstam, who tells her they talk about progress at a certain moment. And she said, I was five and I was in Kiev when I first wore, heard the word progress and I started to cry. Uh, read it in Nadezhda Mandelstam memoirs. It's very interesting. Uh, we know that poets have a, uh, even at the age of five, have a very, very different uh, relationship with, with reality. They see things before. It, you know, poets are seers, as they say. And at the age of five, I think that Mandelstam had premonitions <laughs> that other people could not have had.